Hey guys, welcome to the Beckett Cook Show. I'm Beckett Cook, and today we have a very big issue to tackle. It is all about what the Bible has to say about homosexual behavior. And there are a lot of re revisionist voices out there. Revisionists are the people who say that the Bible's prohibitions against same-sex sex is doesn't apply today. And we'll get into why those revisionist understandings of the Bible are false. First, I want to just get an overview of the biblical picture because the Bible is not a handbook on homosexuality. The Bible is the greatest love story ever told. And so I don't want us as believers to miss the forest for the trees. However, the trees are very important nonetheless. So we're, today we're going to look at the trees in the Bible. There's six passages I want to go through in the Bible and look at what they say about homosexuality, what, what it means in the original language, and what are some of the common objections to this meaning of the historical biblical view of sexuality. So let's begin in the beginning. Genesis. So if you go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, etc. And so, and then we go to chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 24, it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So just at the very beginning of creation, the very beginning of the word of God, we see this one flesh union between a male and a female and how that is God's design for sex. It's, it's clear from the very, very beginning. And the way the woman was created indicates a divinely designed complement to the man. And also this, the one flesh union presupposes two people of the opposite sex. Also, only this kind of design can fulfill the mandate to be fruitful and multiply. Not that that's the only purpose of marriage, but it, it's key to marriage. So Jesus reiterates this in the New Testament, this union between one man and one woman that God designed from the very beginning. He reiterates it in Matthew chapter 19 when the Pharisees come up to him and they, they're, they're asking him a question about divorce. And he, he answers them and he says, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So again, Jesus reiterates what the creation account says about what marriage is, that it's a union of a male and a female, and it becomes one flesh. And a lot of people say, well, well Jesus never mentions homosexuality in the Gospels. Well, that's kind of a red herring. Well, it is a red herring because Jesus doesn't mention a lot of things. He doesn't mention pederasty. He doesn't mention bestiality. And also Jesus was preaching to Jews and Jews were very well aware of the Torah and what the Torah had to say about homosexual behavior and in Leviticus 18 and, and 20. So it was just understood amongst the Jews that homosexual activity was immoral and wrong and sinful. So Jesus had no need to reiterate that to, to them. However, Paul was speaking to the apostle Paul was speaking to Gentiles and Gentiles had no concept of what was up and what was down, what, what was, uh, what was okay and what wasn't. They didn't have the Torah they didn't know the law. They didn't know the biblical mandate and the biblical sexual ethic. So Paul had to spell it out for them. And that's why Paul talks about homosexuality. But we'll get to that in, in a little bit. 
And then Paul in Ephesians talks about marriage again, and he says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So Paul even takes the biblical mandate of sex between a man and a woman in marriage to another level. He takes it to a divine level of the marriage, the ultimate marriage of Christ, the bridegroom, and his church, the bride. So we as Christians are the bride of Christ, and Paul calls it a profound mystery, which it, which it is. It's amazing. And so all of earthly marriage between a man and a woman is pointing to this ultimate marriage in heaven with Christ as the bridegroom and us as the, as the, the bride. So that is, again, Paul reiterating the Genesis account and making it very clear what marriage is. The next place I want to go is Genesis 19, the famous story of Sodom and Gomorrah. So as you will recall, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is Lot, Abraham's nephew, invites two men to stay with him, two visitors who were are, who are in town, and he invites them to stay with him. It turns out these two men are happen to be angels. And the men of Sodom, both young and old, as it says, come to Lot's house and demand to have sex with these two men who are angels. And so there is an aspect, yes, of, of this kind of uh, exploitative um, activity and this, this sort of um, rape, basically, that's that they're attempting they're attempting to rape these two men so if you look at ezekiel chapter 16 it references sodom and it says and this is verse 49 it says behold this was the guilt of your sister sodom she and her daughters had pride excess of food and prosperous ease but did not aid the poor and needy so yes there were other sins going on with sodom but in verse 50 he says, they were haughty and did an abomination before me. And the word, the Hebrew word for abomination here is the same Hebrew word that is used in Leviticus 18 and 20 when it talks about a male lying with a male being an, an abomination. So, and also there's, has been graffiti discovered in Pompeii. Pompeii was destroyed by a volcanic eruption in 79 AD. And there's a graffiti of male sex with the words Sodom and Gomorrah next to it. So Sodom and Gomorrah were buzzwords for basically homosexual activity. And in Jude, verse 7, Jude is in the New Testament, and Jude is Jesus' brother and James's brother. And he says, Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So yes, there were other issues in Sodom and Gomorrah, but one of the key issues was homosexual activity, and that's why God brought judgment on that city. And so let's look at Leviticus, famous Leviticus verse uh, chapter 18 and 20. Let's go to chapter 18. And in chapter 18, verse 22, it says, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. In chapter 20, it says, if a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. Those are pretty harsh words. And the revisionists will say, well, no, I mean, shellfish was prohibited and uh, mixed clothing, fibers of clothing was prohibited. But those, those were not moral laws. If you ate shellfish, there, wasn't, there was no need for an atonement, an animal sacrifice for that. So those were ceremonial or dietary laws um, to keep the Israelites set apart from the nations. Even with the prohibitions surrounding menstruation, there still wasn't a 
it wasn't a sin. It was, there was no sacrifice required for that. And this was all about ritual uncleanness. It wasn't about uh, morality. And so with the coming of Christ, there is no sacrificial system anymore. The whole system which required ritual cleanness has been removed in the new covenant. And in the new covenant, cleanness of the heart is what is moral, not ritual. And Jesus, as you know, in Mark, in the Gospel of Mark, declares all food clean. And just like homosexuality, adultery and incest are reaffirmed as sins in the New Testament. And Jesus would have known, obviously, Leviticus by heart. And so he wasn't unaware of these prohibitions and he wasn't unaware of homosexual behavior being sinful. Okay, let's move on to Romans, the New Testament. Romans chapter 1. In this passage, verse 18 through 27, Paul talks about these exchanges. There's three exchanges that take place that suppress the truth. And let's talk about the first exchange. Paul says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And then he goes on to say, Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged, again, the second exchange, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And then the third exchange, Paul says, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And so this is, these are pretty strong words that Paul is saying. And notice that one of the, the, the illustrations Paul gives of suppressing the truth is homosexual behavior. So that's pretty powerful. And the issue is not pederasty because there is no record of women doing this in the ancient world. And this also can't be a master and slave situation, an exploitative situation, because it says in verse 27, it says they were consumed with passion for one another, which indicates that it was consensual. It was a consensual sexual interaction. Also, gender here is the point, not orientation or exploitation or domination. And Paul says that this kind of sexual behavior is contrary to nature. And Paul uses this term contrary to nature. And in the Greek, the term is parasusin. And that, that Greek term was commonly used in the ancient world for deviant forms of sexual activity, especially homosexuality. And also, if you just look at the passage, there are, there are allusions to the, the Genesis creation account in verse 20, verse 25, 26. So Paul, again, he's grounding his argument in the creation account, in that original account of what sex, sexuality is, what God's design for sex is between one man and one woman for life in a covenant and they become one flesh. So Paul is grounding his argument in Genesis. Now let's look at Paul's letters to the Corinthians and to Timothy. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, it says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, etc., will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, Paul uses two Greek words in this verse. He uses the word malakoi and arsenikoitai. So the English translation of practice homosexuality is actually based on these two different words that Paul uses, these Greek words. And so let's look up malakoi first. Malakoi in the Greek lexicon 
Malakoi means one who is passive in a same-sex relationship. And our Senekoitai in the Greek lexicon means a male who engages as dominant entity in same-sex activity. So Paul actually uses two words. So basically the passive male in the sexual relationship and the active male. In 1 Timothy, Paul says, Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, etc., etc. So, again, Paul uses this word, arsenikoites, for men who practice homosexuality. So where does Paul get this word arsenikoitai or arsenikoites, which is the plural form? Well, if you look at the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Old Testament that was used by Jews in the first century, because obviously in that area of the world, it was Hellenized because of Alexander the Great. So Koine Greek or Common Greek was used as the lingua franca in that time. And so the Old Testament was translated into Koine Greek. So in Leviticus 18, in the Septuagint, the Greek words arsenos and koiten are used when referring to you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. And in Leviticus 20, verse 13, the same thing, arsenos and koiten, those two Greek words are used when it says, whoever shall lie with a male as with a woman. So Paul comes up with this term, arsenikoites, to mean homosexual behavior. And he gets it from this, these verses in the Greek Septuagint. And arsen means man and koite means bed. So man bed or bedders of men is what it means. So that's how Paul came up with this term to mean homosexual behavior. And the reason there's so much discussion around this now in, in our culture and the revisionists are trying to make the Bible say what it doesn't mean or revise what it means is because over obviously over the last 50 years, the, our culture has changed dramatically. We've gone, homosexual behavior has gone from a sin to a sacrament in the span of 50 years. So it's no surprise that there would be those trying to revise what the Bible says about homosexual behavior. Also, the Bible is uniformly negative towards same-sex activity. There's no positive argument for homosexuality in the Bible. And so this argument from silence is a very, very weak argument. And then there's the cultural distance argument from the revisionists. And they say that, oh, Paul didn't know about, you know, consensual homosexual love as we would know it today. He wasn't aware of that. But that, too, is a lie because in antiquity, there were there's a lot of examples of consensual adult homosexual love. Plato talks about it in his symposium. Uh Plutarch talks about it in his life of Pleopidas. And in that story, Plutarch talks about this, this, this group of soldiers called the Sacred Band, which were, they were part of the Theban army. And this Sacred Band was made up of 300 men, and they were pairs of lovers, male lovers. And the general would always put this group of soldiers this was in the fourth century bc they would put the these soldiers on the front line because they knew that these homosexual lovers would defend to the death to protect their their lover and so plutarch talks about adult consensual homosexual love plato talks about it in his symposium uh, xenophon talks about it in his symposium so Paul would have been very much aware 
of ancient Greek philosophy. I mean, if you just look at Acts 17 or Titus 1, Paul, it's clear that Paul was all too aware of Greek philosophy and literature. And so he would have known about this. And homosexual activity was rampant in the ancient world, in the ancient Greco-Roman world. And yes, there were there were forms of, of pederasty and there were... Uh, abusive, exploitive relationships, but there were also consensual adult relationships, homosexual relationships. So the Bible is very clear about homosexual behavior being sinful and wrong. And, and it's, it's important to know this. It's important to understand this because it has eternal consequences. I mean, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, do not be deceived. Those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And also in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. So that's pretty strong. And in 1 John, the Apostle John says, No one who abides in Christ keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. And he goes on to say, this is chapter 3, he goes on to say, Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And then he says, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. So it's very clear that if you're born again and you continue in unrepentant sin, it's a, it's, it's not good. (laughs) There are not good consequences to that. And that's why it's so important to be clear on the Word of God and to be constantly in the Word of God and reading it to be to renew our minds and to renew our hearts and to rem- remind ourselves of what the truth is because the culture is so powerful and so dominant and it's for the last thir- at least 30, 40 years, it's been brainwashing us and indoctrinating us into all kinds of Uh, lies. And Satan, this isn't the first time Satan has twisted God's word. I mean, Satan has been doing this from the very beginning. In the garden, he said to Eve, are you sure you can't eat from that tree? Did God really say? And he's doing the same thing today with this issue of homosexuality. He's, He's saying, well, does the Bible really say, does the word of God really say this about homosexual activity? And he's twisting God's word once again. And he has so many people deceived, so many people in the church deceived. And he is, people are just buying this lie hook, line, and sinker. And Satan is thrilled. He's laughing his head off. He's laughing all the way to the bank because he's leading so many people down the road of destruction. And I just think of Proverbs chapter 3 where he says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. This issue of homosexual behavior, it might seem, you know, unfair. It might seem bizarre that God would prohibit this kind of sex. But again, we have to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts and not lean on our own understanding because we... God knows what's best for us. He knows what's best for human flourishing. He created sex to be expressed within the covenant of marriage between one man and one woman for a reason. And it may seem antiquated to us. It may seem unfair to us, but we have to trust that God knows what's best for us, that God has our best interests at heart, and that he knows how we are going to flourish as human beings the best. I just want to end on this verse from 2 Timothy chapter 4 because it's I think it sums it up. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. 
So I hope that was helpful and I hope that was edifying to you. And thank you for watching. Next week, I want to get into this. There's this there's this article circulating and people have sent it to me several times. And it's this article uh, about how the word homosexual wasn't brought into the Bible until 1946. And I want to get into this article and debunk what it's saying because it's it's completely erroneous. And again, it's a red herring and it's a, another attempt to deceive Christians. And so I, Lord willing, I want to get into this, this article next time. But for now, that's it for the Becca Cook Show. Thank you for joining and I will see you next week. Don't forget to like and subscribe and share. Thank you. Bye.